Henry Moore, Threads of Influence Henry Moore developed a distinct style that was uniquely his own. He came to this visual language through the intense study of art from across history and global cultures. From the early 20th century, in progressive artistic circles, there was an increased interest in antiquities and art from Africa, Asia, Oceania and the Americas, and Henry Moore, like many of his contemporaries, drew inspiration from these cultures. Through Moore's work, the global sources of modernism were laid bare. In his lifetime, Moore became the most famous British artist recognised around the world for his sculpture. Whilst known principally as a sculptor, he experimented in various mediums, including drawing and printmaking. He persistently revisited a few key subjects, namely the mother and child, the reclining female figure and the seated figure. Henry Moore was born in Castleford, Leeds in 1898 and studied at Leeds College of Art and then at the Royal College of Art in London. He relocated from London to Perigreen, Hertfordshire during the Second World War where he lived and worked until his death in 1986. Henry Moore's close friendship with the photographer John Hedgeco resulted in some of the most candid photographs of Moore towards the end of his life. Although Moore had stopped making sculpture by this time, his hands are the focus of this composition. Hedgeco described them as the hands that created so many works of art. Henry Moore promoted himself via photography and film more than any British artist before him. His close friendship with photographer John Hedgeco from 1956 to the end of Moore's life resulted in thousands of images of the sculptor and his work and four books dedicated to them. This photograph shows Moore alongside the shadow for his sculptor King and Queen 1952 to 53, which becomes uncanny when in silhouette. In the standing pose with clasped hands, Moore was inspired by ancient Sumerian figures circa 4000 to 2270 BCE that were made for temples in the historical region of Mesopotamia, now southern Iraq. Moore saw these in the British Museum. He also saw a drawing by Michelangelo, 1475 to 1564, of the Virgin Mary, which has two profiles, one still visible from an earlier composition. It was this drawing that inspired Moore to deconstruct the face of this sculpture. Moore, who dedicated his career to representing the female figure, said of Cycladic sculpture, despite the simplicity of form, the figures are very feminine in feeling. Many modernist artists appreciated the purity of Cycladic sculpture with its powerfully stylized form made of white marble although they were likely to have been originally painted. The figures were often found at burial sites. Henry Moore carved the original for a reclining figure from an iron stone found on the beach in Norfolk. It was one of the first times he carved through the stone to create a hole. The iron stone soon started to disintegrate, so the artist had it cast in bronze and patinated to resemble the colour of the stone. The reclining figure was the most recurrent subject in Moore's sculpture, as he believed it offered opportunity for experimentation. The difference between this angular work and the earlier rounded reclining figure work displayed nearby demonstrates Moore's interest in surrealism, which had risen in the 1930s. Jacob Epstein was the most famous sculptor in Britain when Moore was a young artist. Moore followed Epstein in his interest in carving directly into stone without a preliminary model. Epstein's earliest known sculpture, Baby Asleep, which was modelled in clay before being cast into bronze, is more naturalistic than his later carvings. As a young artist, Henry Moore depicted babies in both sketches and sculpture. Henry Moore was devoted to life drawing throughout his career, believing it would help him to understand three-dimensional form. As a young artist, he asked his wife, Irina, to model for him. The rounded body with thick outlines in this drawing show his interest in representing solid form, and the face almost resembles one of his sculptural masks that he was making throughout the 1920s.
Universal Themes As a student, Moore was told to study examples of classical art in the V&A. However, he spent his spare time in the British Museum observing the African, Ancient Egyptian, Mexican and Oceanic sculpture. As he encountered these objects removed from their original context, he responded to their aesthetic qualities rather than their cultural relevance, often appropriating their styles in his own work. He found certain subjects, such as the mother and child, possessed a powerful symbolism that transcended geographical and cultural boundaries. It has been a universal theme from the beginning of time. He believed that its representation offered a universal form that anyone could appreciate. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Europe, there was a growing interest in acquiring antiquities and material culture from around the world, in part led by artists. This enabled the widespread movement of these artefacts, resulting in their placement in European museums and private collections. Later in his career, Henry Moore himself amassed a large collection of antiquities and art from across the world. The mother and child was one of Moore's earliest subjects in sculpture, but in the 1940s he began to concentrate on groups of two parents with one or two children. This new subject was thanks to a sculpture commission for Impington Village College, Cambridgeshire, which was intended as a cultural centre for the entire community. Moore explored his ideas in clay maquettes in 1944 before turning to the subject in drawing. Henry Moore described the mother and child as one of his inexhaustible subjects. His sketches demonstrate how he studied examples he saw in museums and books and considered how they could be transformed into his own sculpture. He appreciated the subject for its compositional effect of balancing a small and large form. In 1942, Moore was commissioned to make a Madonna and Child for St Matthew's Church in Northampton. The subject extended his interest in the mother and child, one of his most enduring themes. The maquettes he made in clay were his first sculptures since the outbreak of war and the first time he used drapery in sculpture. This bronze was cast from the maquette that was selected for the final sculpture executed in stone. Moore had studios for different purposes. In his maquette studio, where he made his small models for sculpture, he gathered natural objects such as bones and flint to serve as inspiration. Sometimes he would make the maquettes from pressing clay directly onto these found materials. The maquette studio was the most photographed of Moore's studios, and its image still contributes to the understanding of his work as being inspired by nature. Created during Moore's most abstract phase, square form subtly suggests a creature with eyes and a beak. It may point to Moore's interest in ancient Mexican art. I've always had a liking for squareness. This may be one reason why I appreciate Mexican and particularly Aztec sculpture. Green Horton stone can be highly polished and Moore used this quality to emphasise the curves in this sculpture. Moore based this composition on his sister, Mary, knitting and his wife, Irina, reading a book. He used what he described as sectional lines to describe three-dimensional form vertically and horizontally. Whereas in most of Moore's drawings, these sectional lines were used to indicate contour, in the faces of these figures, they diverged to become a pattern. Experiments in printmaking. As a young student, Henry Moore had created some woodcuts, but he did not try printmaking again until after the Second World War, when he learned the etching technique. Printmaking became such an important part of his practice that in 1970, he had a printing press installed in his studio. In the following years, he became prolific in both etching and lithography. He collaborated with printmakers and publishers, particularly in the production of portfolios. These were focused on subjects such as zoo animals, sheep, Stonehenge and literary themes. 
Moore believed the process of etching, using a sharp point to incise a plate, was well suited to sculptors. In contrast, he described lithography as painterly, as each colour is applied separately by a different plate. Despite this distinction, he produced more lithographs with 405 lithographs to 314 etchings recorded by the artist. Moore published The Animals in the Zoo portfolio in 1983 with depictions of 12 animals from London Zoo. The etchings were created from Moore's earlier drawings, which he had made from photographs taken by his assistant. Although known for his representations of the human form, Moore also depicted animals throughout his career, and he explained that animals can teach you all sorts of things about sculptural form. In 1949, Moore was invited to participate in the school's print project, initiated by Brenda and Derek Ronsley, who had the idea of commissioning a selection of leading contemporary artists to create high-quality lithographic prints to be shown in schools, as a way of stimulating an interest in modern art by bringing contemporary art to young children who would otherwise not have had the opportunity to see good work. Other artists participating included Pablo Picasso, Henry Matisse, George Brack, John Nash, John Tunnard and Gillian Trevelyan. The Impact of War During the Second World War, Moore was unable to work on sculpture as materials were scarce. Therefore, his drawings took on more importance than ever before. They became developed works of art rather than studies for sculpture. The war also gave Moore new subject matter and he was inspired to create drawings of the crowds sheltering in the London underground during the Blitz. Moore became an official war artist and thanks to these drawings, he rose to national prominence. They remain some of his most iconic works. Moore had served in the First World War, where in 1917, at the age of 18, he was gassed at the Battle of Cambrai. This experience allowed him to study art on an ex-serviceman's grant. Due to his age, he did not have to serve in the Second World War. He joined the local home guard in Hertfordshire, where he relocated when his London studio was bombed. Henry Moore developed the technique of using wax relief and watercolour wash in the mid-1930s and by the end of the decade he was frequently employing it for his works on paper. At this time, his sculptures were relatively small, but the freedom of working on paper meant that he could suggest the possibility of monumental sculptural scale. After more than a year of creating his shelter drawings, Moore tired of the subject. In his capacity as an official war artist, he was asked to depict the industrial activity of coal mining. He chose to visit the Welldale Colliery in Castleford, Yorkshire, where his father had worked when he was a child. The subject did not interest him as much as his shelter drawings, and he made fewer of these works. Henry Moore created six drawings to illustrate Edward Sackville West's The Rescue, a play based on Homer's The Odyssey. This drawing, a variation on one published, depicts Odysseus asleep in a cave. As described in the play, he has his face to the opening so that the dawn may wake him. The literary subject extends Moore's interest in the tunnel that he had explored in his shelter drawings. Moore often explored his sculptural subjects on paper, and this composition combines two of his favourite themes, the reclining figure and the family group. It also demonstrates his growing interest in drapery, which first appeared in his shelter drawings and later figured in his sculptures. 
When Henry Muir saw the crowds of people sleeping in the underground shelters, he thought they looked like his sculptural reclining figures. Though indistinct, the alert poses and dark eyes of some of these figures convey the tension of their experience.